On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to take up chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. Along with chapters 15 and 16, Gary Stearman is here to discuss with me revealing Revelation. Well, J.R. Revelation is without a doubt uh, not only a complex book, but a, a very difficult book to understand. In my opinion, it'll never really be fully understood until the days in which the events of Revelation are actually played out. And that is still yet future to us. Now, we've just come out of Revelation 13. We're moving into Revelation 14. And uh, the timing on this is very interesting. We've been discussing the fact that you really can't place the events of Revelation in perfect chronological order. Now, Gary, before we get started, I wanted to mention that if you really want to know what the book of Revelation is all about, you need to understand rabbinical teachings especially the Hebrew alphabet. We have a series of 28 studies on the Hebrew alphabet on seven VHS videotapes. And to me, they're absolutely essential in understanding not only the book of Revelation, but all the way back to Genesis. You know, J.R., what you're saying is true. Now, we do not follow rabbinic rule. I want to be quick to say that. But there is valuable teaching in the history of Israel among the sages of Israel, and J.R., I don't know of a student of Revelation who doesn't say that Revelation is a Jewish book. Yes. Right after, the, from the church age, uh, uh, in uh, Revelation 1, 2, and 3, uh, starting with chapter 4, it's a Jewish book. Right. When we get to chapter 14, this corresponds with the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet in such a marvelous way, Gary. And that 14th letter is the letter Nun, which is the symbol of faith. And it's not simply faith, but it is the whole concept of faith. The faithful who follow the Lord, uh, they may suffer setbacks. They may, may suffer tragedies and downfalls, but nevertheless, they follow the Lord, and in the end, they will rise victorious. That's the meaning of this letter. And J.R., here we have the 144,000. Isn't that amazing? It is. Yeah. It, the meaning, I guess, would be of uh, the noon, the 14th letter, you can't keep a good man down. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And uh, we have then a 14.1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. And with him, and 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. This is a beautiful picture. We saw them sealed uh, in chapter 7. Now here in 14, they're standing on Mount Zion. And by the way, J.R., this is a piece of real estate. We're not talking about a, some symbolic thing here. Mount Zion is a piece of real estate in downtown Jerusalem. The Temple Mount. Yes. Now, this is not a metaphoric Temple Mount here. This is the Temple Mount. It is. It's not in heaven, it's on earth. The interesting thing we see about chapter 14 is that it corresponds with chapter 7. You know, the, the chap, even the chapters in Revelation are laid out in sevens. They are. So here we have chapter 7, the 144,000 on earth and an innumerable host of saints in heaven. And here in chapter 14, we have the 144,000 on earth. And in chapter 15, the innumerable host in heaven. It matches perfectly. Now, they have done their work. Uh, they are positionally, verse 5 says, in their mouth was found no guile, and they are without fault before the throne of God. Positionally, they are redeemed. They're standing before the throne. They're gathered on Mount Zion, which is the, is the most important piece of territory on the face of this planet. And they are celebrating a victory. And J.R., this tells us right away that we can't put this in any particular time sequence. This is a parenthetical uh, event. So it's a timeless event. He's looking at this from heaven. We cannot place this any particular place. It looks to me like it's after the second coming of Christ. It, it does indeed. So what he's doing is just taking snapshots. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a chronological sequence here. The interesting thing is the Lamb stands with them. So it has to be after his second coming. Mm -hmm. Now, He's standing on the Temple Mount. You know, it's interesting. There's a controversy going on over the Temple Mount these last few months. That's right. The Grand Mufti Hussein of Jerusalem has made the statement that the Temple Mount is no longer the property of Jews or Christians, strictly and solely the property of 
uh, the Islamic authorities, and uh, they plan on appropriating it as theirs alone. And to prove that it belongs to them and not to anybody else, they've gone in with bulldozers and trucks and excavated under the Solomon Stables area and hauled out tons and tons and tons of debris from the first and second temple periods and dumped them in the Kedron Valley. Mm -hmm. And then they paved the area and made a huge prayer hall under the Al-Aqsa Mosque, under the entire south end, over to the Solomon Stables area for the Muslims to pray because they're planning on a peace. And when this peace comes, they expect to have thousands upon thousands of pilgrims coming from Amman and from Damascus and from all of the Arab world. And Jerusalem is going to look like Mecca <laughs> with hundreds of thousands of Arabs coming in to worship. This is really going to put a logistic strain on the situation. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, uh, there is a prophecy in Zechariah where the Lord said he's going to make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. And this is uh, happening even as we speak. J.R., you know, uh, Mount Zion here is seen as a vignette along with another vignette, which is three angels flying in heaven. One of the angels is crying out, uh, that the gospel is to be spread over the entire earth prior to judgment. The, another angel is uh, pronouncing doom on Babylon. And a third angel basically is pronouncing doom on the beast and his image. So right here in the context of the victory of the 144,000, you have the doom of, of the world system. So we're moving back and forth in time here. Yes, we are. But he's seeing this from another dimension, from the dimension we call heaven. And uh, therefore, it's in a timeless dimension. He's looking at time from eternity, and he doesn't see it in chronological order here. Exactly. And to prove that, then, the concluding verses of chapter 14, 14 through 20, uh, speak of the judgment of the harvest, and there are seven sickles mentioned here. This, of course, compares with chapter 19 and the second coming of Christ in the clouds of glory. Mm -hmm. There, it's a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Here, it is a sickle. And it's interesting, Gary, you mentioned that there are seven times this, these sickles are mentioned in these verses. There we have another series of sevens. <laughs> Amazing. And by the way, uh, the seven, as we've pointed out so many times, is based upon the temple menorah. And the most important member of the seven is the central or fourth member. And the central sickle here is uh, in verse 17, and, and another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And you know, this mention of the temple, judgment now issuing forth from the temple, uh, I would place this at the end of the, or toward the end of the tribulation period. Yes, because his coming in clouds here uh, smacks of chapter 19. So this would be basically the battle of Armageddon. In fact, it goes on to say that the blood comes out of the wine press, the wrath of God. And um, this definitely is uh, smacks of Armageddon. It does. We have, the, the, of course, the, the blood uh, running down, and I believe probably running down the Jordan River Valley for uh, well over a hundred miles. And I think this is actually going to come to pass. A that's, terrible judgment. Now it's interesting, Gary, that there are two sickles listed here. Now in the uh, ancient star charts, which we feel was the original Bible before Moses wrote Genesis, uh, there is a sickle coming out of the mouth of Leo the lion. Mm -hmm. This is also comparable with the two-edged sword coming from the mouth of Christ in Revelation 19. But here we see the sickle. It's interesting that Saturn's symbol is also a sickle. And it, it appears that um, Saturn is going to meet with Regulus, um, which is the star in the handle of the sickle. There's two sickles meeting together. And what we have then is the king, the, actually the, the, the lamb who became the lion of the tribe of Judah with the sickle, and the Regulus is the king star. And all of this symbolizes judgment at the end of the age, and, and the book of Revelation therefore puts all this together. Uh, those two uh, lights in the sky meet periodically, but they are a prophecy, I think, of the coming Armageddon. We'll be back in just a moment. 
Revelation chapter 15 corresponds with the Hebrew letter Samik. Gary? Samik is the letter of divine support, protection, and memory. It stands for it being a circular letter, it is said to resemble a fortress wall with a, with a believer in, uh, carefully encapsulated by God in, inside a wall of protection. Uh, and the, the letter also stands for signs and uh, remembrances, things that help you to remember. So it's said to be the letter of support, protection, and memory. And here, J.R., we have all of those perfectly illustrated. Yes, we do. And the rabbis say that this encircled letter um, represents the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, in, we're under God's protection in the, um, in the hidden place, in, in the Holy of Holies. Well, here we have yeah. the multitude of saints in heaven standing before the throne of God. This is certainly a Holy of Holies, isn't it? Yeah, and the, the psalmic uh, makes the sound of the letter S. And the word simanim means signs. Siman is a sign. Well, here 15.1 says, And I saw another sign in heaven. Great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And then we have this marvelous image of the throne of God, and we have some people standing before that throne and doing a very specific act. Yes. Now, first we have the saints here, the same saints we see in Revelation chapter 7, mm -hmm. and the 144,000 of chapter 7 are in chapter 14, so here is the same situation that we see in chapter 7, that's chapters 14 and 15. And then, of course, these angels come out before the throne of God with seven vials of wrath. God is about to pour out His wrath, and this is, liturgically speaking, this is the high holy day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. Uh, when the high priest takes the blood and mixes it, uh, the blood of the goat and the blood of the bull, and, and takes it out after taking it into the Holy of Holies, he takes the remainder of the blood out and dashes it at the base of the brazen altar. Mm -hmm. And that representing the earth, the earth is about to receive seven vials of bloody wrath. And J.R., uh, the psalmic also stands for memory. And here, uh, the saints are singing the Song of Moses, verse 3. The Song of Moses, the servant of God, and the Song of the Lamb. And J.R., the Song of Moses is very, very special. Uh, it has this in it, in Deuteronomy 32, 7. Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. And, uh, and this is exactly what those saints are doing. They are remembering the Song of Moses. From our book that we have written entitled Hidden Prophecies in the Song of Moses, we have determined that these days of old are the six days of creation mm -hmm. and the seventh day wherein God rested. And the rabbis have taught that these represent 7,000 years of human history. Well, Gary, we are coming upon the seventh millennium. And the interesting thing is the rabbis call that the day of the Lord. Absolutely. And that's what we have here. Now, uh, again, we have a timeless vision. Uh, uh, Revelation 14 and 15 are both in this realm of timelessness. You cannot assign these to a particular year in the tribulation. Uh, however, this appears to be a song of victory toward the end of the tribulation, coinciding with those seven sickles. You know, if we actually thoroughly investigated all that we're talking about, it would take too many programs. It, oh, it <laughs> this would. Is, this is so abbreviated. I feel, you know, that, oh, I wish I could say more about the Song of Moses. Right. <laughs> but we must continue because time is running out. Let's get to chapter 16 and the seven vials of wrath that are poured out upon the earth. Okay, now the, the chapter 16 is an act that definitely uh, is conclusive in the tribulation. And we have this coming out of the temple of God. The last uh, uh, chapter of, of uh, Revelation 15 says, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no man was able to enter the, ta uh, the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So out of the temple of God, the Holy of Holies comes this last judgment, the seven vials. And J.R., I'm going to skip right to the fourth vial because we have said that the fourth 
of any grouping of seven that you find in the Bible is the most important member. And here we find the fourth angel pouring out his vial upon the sun. Power was given to him to scorch men with fire. We find that once again, this central member of the seven typifies the, the great battle of light versus darkness. Mm -hmm. Gary, it's difficult again to put a time sequence to this because he's looking at this from a timeless view. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot say that each one of these represents a year of the seven years, seven vials, seven years. This is not the case because the first four vials are actually the same event, aren't they? they seem and to they be. correspond with the first four trumpets the trumpet judgments. The trumpets, of course, uh, are the liturgy of Rosh Hashanah, and these vials here represent the liturgy of Yom Kippur, which is 10 days later, but it's still all within the same seventh month. So we cannot say that there is a time factor mm -hmm. in these. They seem to overlap. Uh, so it's, we, we just simply must say that it's the same judgments from a different viewpoint mm -hmm. And the reason he pulls these out is because Rosh Hashanah represents the second coming, Yom Kippur represents the second coming, and it's all fulfilled, it's all mixed together in this. Now these vials are modeled by the terrible plagues that befell Egypt when they refused to let the Israelites go. And Moses confronted Pharaoh. Uh, the first vial is grievous sores upon the flesh. The second vial uh, turns uh, the sea to blood. The third vial turns the fresh water to blood. The fourth vial uh, creates darkness uh, combined with great heat. Uh, uh, and the fifth vial is darkness. The sixth vial is the drying up of the river Euphrates. The seventh vial uh, is a curse upon the atmosphere and upon the kingdoms of men. And J.R., all of these uh, were modeled by the events in ancient Egypt. Yes. One thing we can say for certain, the seventh vial is Armageddon. Yes. The scripture here says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Mm. So we now have the fomenting of the great battle this world will fight. And, uh, you know, Gary, Armageddon appears to be the world against Jesus. Absolutely. And not only that, but even you can extend this further, it appears to be the, the world against Elijah and against Moses as well. So uh, if you think back to the Transfiguration Mount, uh, when Jesus took uh, some disciples up with him and they saw Elijah, they saw Moses, they saw Jesus glorified, I think that was a foreview of what we're seeing here. And you know, it stands to reason in my mind that Moses would be superintending these vile plagues because they're the very same plagues on a larger scale that he oversaw during the days of Pharaoh. Another thing about these, this um, uh, picture of Armageddon here, we don't know exactly the scenario by which it will develop, but it is possible that the Antichrist will after, uh, when demanding the mark in the flesh, that there are certain nations, especially to the east, such as China and other uh, nations in that area, will balk against the idea of a mark in the flesh, especially when he moves to Jerusalem. Um, at least that seems like he's going to set up a world capital at Jerusalem because he will claim to be the Messiah, and the Messiah is prophesied to rule from Jerusalem. This is the time then when the whole world will come for the purpose of destroying the Jews. Kill every Jew on earth. This is genocide yeah. on a grand scale. Genocide on a grand scale. The armies of the world, the kings of the east will be marching across a dried up Euphrates. The spirits of devils, Revelation 16, 14, go forth working miracles. Uh, we have uh, Armageddon prepared at this time. We have the great city divided into three parts, the cities of the nations falling. In other words, it's going to be a time that I doubt that you could describe if you were not there. It's going to be unbelievably uh, cataclysmic. It's everything you know falling to pieces. So connected with Armageddon is this essential message that the one world monetary system will be destroyed, totally, completely destroyed. And that sounds like, uh, to me, 
a nuclear war, a, a war against the one world government, uh, a, total, a total destruction of everything the Antichrist had been trying to put together. And J.R., we can't overlook the geological calamities. Uh, verse 20 of Revelation 16 says, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. That has never happened. That's horrific. The world is going to be remodeled during the Great Tribulation, and the new world that comes out of this and, and moving into the kingdom is going to be a wonderful place. You know, Gary, this seventh vial that is poured out, uh, the voice from heaven says, it is done. That's the same kind of it is finished that Jesus had on the cross of Calvary, isn't it? That's right. It's a fascinating study and a lot there. But you know, it's important that we understand it. We'll be back in just a moment.